This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 762, recorded on May 28th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Howdy. 85 degrees, cloudy, anticipating some rain. We could use some more rain. That's good. From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's uh, 60 Fahrenheit. 60, oh, they're saying 16C, which would actually be 61 Fahrenheit. Um, overcast and uh, supposed to start raining this afternoon and continue raining uh, most of the way through <laughs> Memorial Day weekend. From Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, great to be here. Um, it is 66 and cloudy here. Um, a good day to, you know, hang out inside and do a podcast. Yeah, it got chilly, didn't it, Brian? around here? Yeah, it did. Our guest today is from somewhere where it's probably pretty hot, <laughs> New Orleans. <laughs> He's at Tulane University. Robert Gary, welcome to TWIV. Thank you, Vince. It's about uh, 85 degrees here and very <laughs> sunny day. Very nice in New Orleans. Cool. Well, I don't, uh, I'm, I, we talk about um, your work many times over the years, but this is your first visit to TWIV. I think, Robert, we corresponded way back in the XMRV days, right? We did. Oh, and, man. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think it even, it maybe even goes back farther than that, Vince. I mean, you probably remember a little blog that I started uh, a long time ago called All the Virology on the World Wide Web. Uh, yes, that's oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean... Uh, David Sander, yeah. who's now a mayor in a city in <laughs> California, uh, started that. So David is probably well known to some of the ASV folks. Yes. And uh, yes. yeah, but uh, you know, I kind of like to think that you got you picked up the mantle from that because we haven't really done much with it mm. for for a long time. So, That's right. Uh, so you, you have uh, you have an old uh, history with social media, internet, and virology. That's that's for sure. Yeah. Right. Um, so today we went, we're going to talk. We're going to continue our arc, talking about <laughs> the origins of SARS-CoV-2. It won't go away. Um, but first, I want to hear a little bit about your history, Robert. Uh, where, where you're from, where you were trained, and so forth. Okay. Well, I'm originally from Indiana, <laughs> and uh, but I did my uh, doctoral work at the University of Texas in Austin, which is. Uh, Another great place to be in the South here. And uh, when a position opened up at Tulane, it, it seemed like a great place. I could move a couple hours to the east and uh, and still enjoy the nice uh, southern uh, climate and everything that I'd gotten used to in Austin. So did you um, train fully as a virologist, PhD and postdoc? Uh, yes, I did. I, I worked with uh, uh, Marilyn Waite on Simbus virus and viral entry. So I learned a little bit about, about uh viral entry proteins there. And then I, I stayed on uh, at Austin for a little while uh, and worked with Henry Bowes, who um, is a retrovirologist. And that's where I sort of started my interest in uh, immune suppressive retroviruses, even back before the days of uh, HIV. <laughs> yeah, so you have a, a long publication history of, of, on retroviruses, but also more recently other viruses as well, right? That, that's right. So um, after the 9-11, the anthrax attacks and, and other, you know, the other terrorist events there, you know, NIH started putting money into uh, emerging viruses. And so uh, um, I was, you know, looking around, I'd been in HIV work for about 20 years. We accomplished a lot about, you know, the envelope proteins and cytopathogenesis, how T cells get killed, things like that. So I was kind of, you know, looking around, you know, for a little other things to do. And NIH just started putting money into these emerging viruses, which I was always interested in. And so it turns out that a um, the CDC had kind of stopped funding some of their work on emerging viruses around that time in 83. It seems kind of ironic, but that, that happened. And um, so a faculty member, a new faculty member in the School of Public Health here came over and Dan Bausch and I got together and, and put in a research proposal to do some diagnostic assays for a virus called Lassa uh, in, in West Africa. So we actually got that grant funded eventually. Um, 
at the end of a, you know, well, the, the grant, we got the grant funded in 2004, but it wasn't really supposed to start until 2005. And so um, right before that uh, grant was scheduled to begin, we had a, another little weather event down here. You guys like to talk about the weather. <laughs> uh, Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina hit. And, um, you know, so there was a little question about whether, you know, New Orleans would still exist and Tulane University would still exist and whether we could carry out that that new grant on Lassa fever uh, diagnostics or not. And, you know, Tony Fauci really came to our rescue, actually, and said, look, you've got to give them the grant. You know, you can't stand in their way just because of this disaster, which wasn't anything they're doing. And hmm. so we got the grant funded. We set up the research program there uh, in in West Africa in this little town called Kinema. And uh, so, yeah, for the past uh, 16 years or so, we've been doing a lot of work on emerging viruses. And hopefully we'll be able to explore a little bit more of that along the way, because some of the lessons that we've learned, we're all learning now these days with uh, the COVID pandemic. Mm. So, you got got into, so you got into immunosuppressive retroviruses before HIV came along. That's correct. And then worked on HIV. And then you got into emerging diseases, emerging infections. Um <laughs> And then now, of course, we have a global pandemic of SARS-CoV-2. So I'm yeah. going to be really, really closely tracking what you do next. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, can <come> and, <laughs> we can come back and talk about that, too, because as you, as you know, one of the leading COVID theories, of course, is that the virus leaked from the lab. And I, I have kind of a lot of prior experience in that myself and about being accused of leaking viruses. So yeah, we can visit that too. Bob, how long have you been at Tulane? I've been at Tulane for 37 years. Oh, yeah. Okay. And that's unusual too, right? Because I mean, academics just don't stay in the same spot for that yeah. long. Yeah. Um, but you know, New Orleans is great. You know, I think the culture is wonderful here. The university has just everything I, I need to offer. We have a school of public health, a uh, school of medicine where I'm at. So, you know, other opportunities that come along over the years. I could probably be making a lot more money now, but uh, staying here uh, just made a whole lot of sense for a lot of different reasons. And so I have another comment. I've made this comment before, probably on multiple occasions, but and I'd be interested in your spin on this. You mentioned uh, the uh, 9-11 uh, biodefense uh, bubble um, morphing into emerging viruses. And that strikes me as one of Tony Fauci's strokes of brilliance is to realize that biodefense would in fact be a bubble, uh, but that uh, emerging viruses were under the same umbrella and yeah. needed attention uh, and could be uh, so that that uh, initial interest spawned by 9-11 could be stretched out into uh, uh, an interest, continuing interest in emerging viruses. Yeah, absolutely, Rich. I, I, and, you know, I mean, Tony is, has been one of my heroes because, you know, I worked on HIV for a long, long time and, and he led that effort. But he is really prescient in a lot of different ways. I mean, I'm now part of a, another network um, called CREED, which... Uh, stands for Center of Research in Emerging Infectious Diseases. And that actually got started in, in uh, 2018. So NIH, NIAID, under Fauci's guidance, actually set up a program that you know couldn't be more relevant now. So Robert, um, you know, shortly after the um, emergence of SARS-CoV-2 in the US anyway, 2020, uh, you and um, a few other people co-authored an article, Christian Anderson, Andy Rambo, Ann Lipkin, and Eddie Holmes. Uh, you co-authored this article, The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2. And we saw it first uh, in a much longer version on virological.org. That's right. <laughs> and we actually talked about it on TWIV. And now it's in, it was eventually published in Nature in a much shorter version. I really liked the longer version. I thought it was better, but... I'm sure nature made you do that. 3,000 words. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm curious. I want to talk about the contents. Um, how did you get involved uh, with this? Well, uh, Christian Anderson and I had been working for a long time. You probably uh, know Christian. He's a generational scientist, in my opinion, one of, one of just the, the most promising uh, young scientists out there. He was a postdoc in the lab of Pardis Sabeti. 
<laughs> who's at the Broad Institute, Harvard and MIT, another generational scientist too. She's she's just uh, brilliant and fantastic, and and you know does does awesome work. So Christian and I had been working together for a long time. Christian, um, you know, is a you know a geneticist does does viral evolution. So it was natural for him to get involved with Eddie Holmes and hmm. Andrew Rambo, who really together between them really uh, I think. If not founded, it certainly were in the founding father group of evolutionary virology. So, I mean, I've been interested in that too myself over the years, looking at the evolution of viral glycoproteins uh, and the like. And so, um, I think it was a you know, Christian recognized that if we were going to look at the origins of SARS-CoV-2, that we needed to have somebody that was on the protein side too, in addition to the um, in addition to the the genetics and the you know the evolutionary structure that uh, Eddie and um, Andrew brought to the mix, and uh, you know Ian also in there too uh, at your place I believe or mm-hmm. close by, yeah. uh, you know expert in evol- in the emerging virus field too. So he was brought on a little bit later to just sort of make sure that we weren't, weren't getting anything, you know, mixed up in terms of the emergence of coronaviruses and other emerging viruses. So I think it was a pretty strong team. Um, That paper, uh, I think, has been downloaded or at least looked at about 5 million times now. It was the most uh, tweeted paper in 2000 and Mm. uh, (laughs) last year. So, you know, all those kind of things, you know, uh, all attention paid to it now. And, And certainly we've you know, been the subject of a lot of attention, not just from the positive side, but from the other side too, of people that, you know, don't believe that the virus has a natural origin. I, 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 I wish people who read it would actually read it. And <laughs> because if they did, they would <laughs> they would not be saying some of the things they do. Uh, in fact, Ian is right across the street uh, from me and I often go to his office and he has this big placard in his office with this article reprinted on it and it says most downloaded article of the year. <laughs> uh, so when did you uh, originally publish this? I mean, it's the, the nature of medicine publication is March, 2020, but as Vincent said, it was posted long before that. It was posted before that uh, back in February. I mean, we okay. started working on it. I mean, Eddie and the rest of us recognized that this was a virus that was going to, you know, it, it, might, it had a big chance of going the way it went just because of respiratory virus. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, we started working on it, on it quite early. I think. Yeah, the, at that time, yeah, there the was barely, respiratory. barely any uh, infection outside of China, right? Yeah, that's true. The, the first draft, I think, was complete in like February 1st. So, uh, you know, that's like a couple of weeks after the sequence was actually released. We were on it. So, so Robert, right from the get-go, there were theories about, well, there are two, right, which persist to this day. One is that it was manufactured in the lab and the other that it simply escaped in some way. Right. And so those are both, that's part of the reason you wrote this, right, to deal with those. Well, yeah. And uh, when we wrote it, I mean, we basically told ourselves and, you know, there, it's in an email chain and other things like that. We, we said, you know, we have to be totally agnostic about how this virus might have emerged. And that that included some of the, you know, politically, you know, potent ideas that, you know, it had been created in the lab in Wuhan. You know, obviously, Dr. Xi there, very leading prominent coronavirologist all the way back to the first SARS. Uh, and that big lab there, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, that was built basically because of SARS-1. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there were, you know, still, you know, there were people there that were talking about, yeah, it was built there, it was manufactured. And, you know, the, the team that, you know, put together this Proximal Origins paper looked at it, and there's just really no evidence for that. And the only thing that, and, and then we did also look at the possibility of that lab creation as well, we we gave it, you know, every unbiased look that we could possibly look at it, and our conclusion then was that it was, you know, very unlikely that was a constructed virus that was cobbled together somehow in the lab, um, and that's held up. In fact, you know, people ask me, well, what do you think about the proximal origins paper? They've asked me a lot that recently over the past few days, actually. You know, how how's that paper held up? And I say it's held up very well. In fact, you know, our conclusion that it didn't leak from the lab is even stronger today than it was, you know, when we wrote the paper, you know, back in February last year. 
So, so what would you say at that point were your main pieces of evidence that it didn't escape from a lab? Okay, so, I mean, you can look at the sequence. And, you know, if you're a virologist, you know that, you know, even if you're doing, you know, the most sophisticated gain of function research that you could possibly be doing, you have to start with a virus that's at least close. And we would estimate, you know, 99%, not even higher than that, 99.9. And those viruses just were not known you know, those viruses, we don't, we still don't know, uh, you know, the, you know, the close progenitor of the virus, but we certainly could surmise that the Wuhan Institute of Virology didn't have a virus that was that close. Okay. And so that, that was one of the main things in our article. You said you need a backbone that was close enough to, to put this virus together. And there was no evidence for that. We, we looked at the features and uh, of the virus, the, the receptor binding domain, that famous furin cleavage site, which we can come back to and discuss maybe in a little bit more detail for the virologist in your audience. Um, but those, you know, are perfectly natural features. I mean, no virologist could have conceived of those in their head because the particular binding solution that the SARS-CoV-2 RBD uh, actually came up with in nature was one that you couldn't design with the computer. In fact, the computer designs at the time said that RBD shouldn't even bind to human ACE, you know, at least not very effectively. So obviously nature came up with a way to do it that, that no human artificial intelligence or anything else, maybe an alien from the future, possibly. But you know, beyond that, this is a, a natural looking virus. So on the flip side, what does the sequence analysis that you did say about the natural origin, uh, what, what uh, sort of conclusions can you make? Well, that, you know, there are bits and pieces of viruses in nature, other coronaviruses, the Sarbica viruses that, you know, basically, yeah, if you, if you knew what SARS-CoV-2 was supposed to look like, if you were, you know, the greatest virologist on the planet, and you could design a, a virus that had these ideal, you know, Thank really, you. Um, you know, very devious uh, pathogenic properties. It spreads easily, you know, aerosol route, affects our most vulnerable population, uh, that kind of thing. If you could, you know, have the insight into virology to design those kind of things, you could find the bits and pieces in nature. But, you know, having the insight to put it all together, we didn't think that was possible for anybody to do, not even the best coronaviruses, virologists. All right, let's interrupt for a second and welcome Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Dixon. Thank you very much, Vincent, and everybody else. Good to see a fellow New Orleans there. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> How you doing? How y'all doing? <laughs> <laughs> we doing fine. <laughs> so glad to hear that. <laughs> so Robert, guys, the, are, the, guys are talking jive, right? The um, oh, we're talking to all the Indians. That's right. <laughs> Since so, the paper came out, there there have been a number of other isolates that have a very similar receptor binding domain, like the pangolin isolates, right? That's correct. Yeah, the pangolin uh, isolate was actually the one that's the closest, actually was described before the pandemic, before the first cases were described. So a lot of people don't recognize that, but it was in late 2019 that a you know, paper in viruses was published. Uh, a group you know, had sort of pulled the sequences out of some metagenomic data, posted it. Nobody paid any attention to it you know, until SARS-CoV-2 came along. And that, that receptor binding domain you know, shares a lot of features with SARS-CoV-2. And if you were designing that RBD, you know, in a lab trying to think mm -hmm. about it, you would have not chosen the pangolin coronavirus if you had known about it even, but you would have, you know, probably picked SARS-1, the classic SARS, which yeah. has a, which binds to human ACE2, but the binding solution is entirely different. The contacts are, are much different. SARS-CoV-2 has, you know, 20 odd contacts with, with the ACE2, uh, SARS-1, you know, six, seven or eight, something like that. So it's a different solution. Right. So based on, based on the sequence analysis, um, you in this paper, a number of other people around the same time, but I think this paper really just crystallized all of it in one place very, very early on in the pandemic um, and basically outlines the argument that this sort of intelligent design theory from the lab is really preposterous. I mean, that's just nobody would design the virus this way. So the, the 
obviously, as I'm sure you're keenly aware, um, the way the way that argument has now evolved is uh, this this argument that no, 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 uh, it wasn't. It wasn't deliberately designed that way, but somebody was doing gain of function experiments, maybe passaging in animals and accidentally evolved SARS-CoV-2 out of some progenitors such as RATG13. Um, and where where do you go with that discussion? And I know you have an updated paper on this as well. Sure. So, I mean, the RATG13, um, you know, is close, 96% when you look overall. I mean, it's actually not the closest virus if you actually take out the recombinant bits and other things like that and do kind of a little bit more of a sophisticated phylogenetic analysis. There are other viruses like, you know, viruses from Cambodia that are actually closer uh, overall in the genome uh, to SARS-CoV-2. So WN Wuhan Institute of Virology didn't even have really the closest virus. They had RETG13. And, and that's kind of where the, you know, the I, I will call them conspiracy theories. I hope you'll let me do that. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I know some people don't like to hear that. But, um, you know, the, the idea is, is that, you know, somehow or other the Wuhan Institute of Virology had this very close virus or SARS-CoV-2 itself. And, you know, when the pandemic started when they got the virus to sequence, instead of telling people, you know, okay, we already had sort of something that was very close, they told people they had RATG13, which is 96% similar. So if you're thinking about what an actual virologist would do, you know, they'd say, okay, yeah, of course we had the virus that was, you know, the likely progenitor. <laughs> we got it from this animal over there, and that totally explains things. They didn't have it. You know, they had RATG13, so that's what they reported and you know this has been sort of twisted and turned around to you know some sort of conspiracy that you know, right they, was the closest one in Cambodia a bad virus it's a bad virus it's a sarbico virus too. Oh, okay you know and you, and you can look at other viruses that have other parts of their genome that are you know even closer than that so it's like I said the bits and pieces are out there in nature uh, somewhere there's a recombinant virus either in a bat or some other animal that is the progenitor of SARS-CoV-2. We, we may find it. We hope we find it. But, you know, it's it's entirely possible. You know, there's just some little, you know, coven of animals somewhere that has, you know, passing this virus around uh, that, you know, we'll never find. So let me but just, that, uh, let me just sure. make this clear. So some people are thinking, okay, RATG13 is not close enough, but they probably had something close and they just didn't tell us. And you're saying that's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm basically saying there's no evidence for that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've heard Dr. Shi. I don't know her. I've never met her. I may, we may have been at some conferences together. I, I have no idea. I, I, but when I listen to her talks, you know, I'm not hearing a person that is, you know, involved in a yeah. in a very deep conspiracy and, and just, you know, not telling the world the truth yeah. about it. Yeah. I'm okay. hearing the opposite. It, it also seems as if um, for, for something like that to have happened, um, the more you think about it, the larger the group of people you would need to be involved at various steps of not only the initial experiment, but also the subsequent cover-up. And uh, the, the probability of keeping something like that secret, particularly when you're dealing with a group of scientists, I mean, for Pete's sake, these, these are the worst secret keepers in the world, right? Uh, and they can't agree on anything. And, and th this, you know, a large amorphous group of scientists is somehow perfectly keeping all these secrets that are, uh, I, it's, it's totally out of character too, Alan, because, you know, what Dr. Shi and her group has been doing over many years since the first SARS, uh, you know, outbreak has been to publish these novel viruses when they find them. You know, a lot of alpha coronaviruses, a few beta coronaviruses, and, you know, publishing papers in the best scientific journals in the world. It's, you know, China has been investing a lot in, you know, their scientific enterprise. They actually spend more dollars or the equivalent of dollars on scientific research than they would do in the United States. They've been doing that for the past decade or so. And the U.S. has been training Chinese scientists for a long, long time as well. I mean, I've been in this for a long, long time and have many, you know, very talented scientists. So, you know, we created that that system over there, right? <laughs> I, I'm sorry I came in late, but I, I wondered, did you cover whether the two people or three people in the Wuhan uh, virology lab got sick from something? <laughs> do, do we know why they were sick? We didn't cover well, that I, yet. 
Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, sorry, sorry. I mean, if you want to talk about that, I can talk about that too. I mean, I, I, I think that's an intelligence report and it came at the end of the Trump administration. Uh, so, you know, you can factor that in uh, however you wish to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not really going to get into the politics. Now, Rich, you're talking about jive here. You're talking about jive. You got jive down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. For sure. But, but think about that for a little bit. Okay. If there were two or three people that were sick enough to go to the hospital, then there were probably hundreds of people of that institute that actually had some right. asymptomatic or milder form of SARS here, here. of COVID-19. And, you know, that's just impossible to, to hide up. So the three were the tip of the iceberg, but there had to be a lot of other people mm -hmm. that were infected. The, the other point to that is, is that, you know, it's, it's serology. They did serology on those people. They were negative. Yeah, okay? right. And, Right, and the right. Institute knows how to do coronavirus serology. So, you know, okay, you can say, okay, they're they're not telling the truth about that either. And and, and that becomes yet another, you know, lie and cover up. I, I think the serology data is important though, uh, because you have to realize that, you know, there's other lab league theories where they say, well, a, a researcher went out in the field, got infected, maybe had an asymptomatic infection, and then came back to the lab or, you know came back and I guess they went to the markets too because so they were all <laughs> they were hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, okay, but so they, they they got it but they didn't know they had it, which is, you know, not very likely on that's pretty weak. <clears throat> and that's I wouldn't even I wouldn't even classify that as a lab leak theory. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much, that's the kind of thing, well, the number of researchers going to the field and, and, and taking such poor safety precautions that they expose themselves worse than the people who are working in those environments. I mean, that's another thing. But the notion that somebody, some person, had contact with some wild animal and then subsequently the spillover event occurred in them and they spread the virus is basically the mainstream, most likely theory, right? So... Yeah, and and, uh, so those encounters with people around the world, right? Yeah, and yeah, the and wildlife I think wildlife industry and other things like that. <laughs> I mean, the the wildlife farming industry in China in 2017 was a 70 billion dollar right, right. That is that that is larger than our that's uh, mind blowing <laughs> industry, which is about 60 billion dollars. So think about that. You know, that's how many people are involved in this wildlife trade. Um, and, and the other thing, you know, from a virology standpoint, there was a um, swine flu outbreak that in China that caused them to cull all of their pigs, right? Right. So that put a huge pressure on the That's true. That is true. That is to provide true. other forms of meat and things right there, right in, you know, right in 2019. So, you know, we've got, got a few things that are out there that are pretty smoking. <laughs> if I can just... Um take a take a whack at the the another aspect of this whole you know three vir three people from WIV got sick uh, isn't that suspicious story um, so first of all as Dixon pointed out that comes from uh, or as uh, actually I think Bob you think I think you may have pointed this out that comes from an intelligence report from the Trump administration it was in fact leaked by a former State Department Trump official apparently to the Wall Street Journal um, so, you know, take that for what it's worth. It's an intelligence report, which means we have zero data. Um, and the reason we have zero data is because one of the critical things to know about intelligence agencies is they actually can't tell you how they know what they know, because that is the most secret thing. <laughs> um, they, they cannot reveal their sources. So we, we don't know what the credibility of that is. We do know the intelligence community considered it credible enough to note, but not credible enough to act on. Um, and the other thing is you mentioned the swine flu at the, at the, the African swine fever, um, swine. virus was, yeah, that's actually, we, we mentioned that on TWIV in, back in 2019 and that was an ongoing issue in China and they had huge pork culls and obviously that put a lot of stresses on the food system, as you said. Um, but the other thing that was going on in fall of 2019, which sh should surprise nobody who listens to this show is that there was a uh, flu influenza actual influenza virus spreading throughout China because um, it's fall, because it's flu season, and because it's China. I mean, the U.S. has this too, but new flu strains often come from China because of the, the agricultural system. Um, and so there were a lot of people showing up at hospitals all over China in October, November of 2019 with respiratory disease called flu. Right. 
And so the notion that people in Wuhan who happened to work at the laboratory showed up at the hospital with respiratory disease, this seems completely non-noteworthy to me. Yeah, uh, uh, very well stated, very well said. I mean, all those things have to factor into it. Uh, I, I'll, one more note about that Trump administration um, uh, memo that it was actually discredited by a assistant secretary of the, um, you know, of defense there in the, our national security uh, at the end of the Trump administration. He went on Fox News basically and said, well, we couldn't trust that. And that's why we stopped it. That's why we pulled it. There was so much junk science in that report that it wasn't credible. Well, that's the reason why we didn't notice it because Fox News usually doesn't publish <laughs> the truth like that. So we weren't used to hearing it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, a clock is right once a day, if, even if it stopped, right? <laughs> So, a red light goes on on my computer to tell me to look. <laughs> um, so when I've had um, some people ask me about exactly this report, um, one of the things that, that I've kind of talked about, and I think that you probably know much more about this, given your work with emerging viruses, is that oftentimes the first cases we sort of diagnose are not actually the first cases. Oh, um, and, and, and there's something about sort of medical care availability that's involved as well. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Well, sure. I mean, that's that's a big question. And, and some of that, I mean, there was no doubt a, a period of circulation of the virus before those first cases were picked up. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I think that they did a pretty good job of identifying a lot of those early cases in spite of the, you know, the surge in the flu cases and, and all, all the other things. They they identified at least 170 or so of those first cases, and more than half of those had, had been to one of the markets in, in, in Wuhan, not just the Hanan market, but, but other markets in the city. And, and so, um, you know, we, we don't know who patient zero is, though. That, that is for sure, and, that, and, and to your point directly. Um, it would be nice to figure that out. We know some of the early cases, uh, but, you know, there's no doubt some circulation that was missed. Now, you can sort of get some ideas about this when you look at the genetics of the virus and how, how it's spreading um, in the population and the mutation rates and things like that. You can look back and see what the time of the most common recent ancestor was. And, and some of my colleagues, like Andrew Rambo, for example, have, have done that. Uh, and, you know, the measurements are not precise, but they, they do say, you know, somewhere mid-November, maybe a little earlier, maybe back into October was when this virus passed over. But, you know, that doesn't leave too much time for, um, you know, for circulation in the city there. Um, the WHO report is also informative on that, on, on this to a little bit too. And if you dig, dig into the into the annexes of that and actually look at the look at the data very closely, you can see that, you know, clearly that Hanan market was a early epicenter. There was probably what we call a super spreading event there. And you can see the early cases showing up around the market and then spreading, you know, the city of Wuhan has this magnificent river, the Yangtze River that goes through the city. And so the cases initially were on one side of the, the river close to that Hanan market. And then as the numbers of cases increased, you can see them slowly spreading and eventually, you know, jumping across that river and going to the other side. So the Hanan market, you know, you can argue was at the source. It probably was not the only source. There may have been a couple of introductions from the wildlife trade into different markets around the same time. Um, but uh, it was clearly a source of a lot of early cases. Can you mention, talk a little bit about that genetics uh, in terms of sort of the early lineages um, and what, how, how, how long that would have taken for divergence and what, what that tells us? Sure, of course. So, um, you know, one of the sort of problems I had with the, the science letter that, that came out and that I think is actually, you know, the point to this is sort of a turning point to where, you know, people started talking a lot more in the public press about the lab leak theory. And the, the, the major problem I have with that letter is, is that they, they basically say there's no evidence for either the lab leak theory or the natural origins theory. And that the WHO report basically added nothing to the conversation, no data. And, and that 
I find not to be true. <laughs> if you actually look through the report, look at a lot of the good information that's in there, there is a lot of granularity. There's a lot of data. Uh, I mean, you, uh, on the TWIB before, you had you know, those, those wonderful virologists there that, you know, experts, the, the people that you should have doing such a study, right? And, and they are going to tell you the same thing I'm telling you right now, is there's a lot of data there that they gathered and looked at, and it's all good data to look at that, that needs to be considered. You just can't blow it off. And so one of those pieces of, of data is about the, the cases associated with the market. And I, I, I mentioned this. It's well known. I mean, it was basically assumed back in the day. I mean, there's a New England Journal of Medicine paper that talks about, you know, those cases associated with not just the non-market, but the other markets in, in, in Wuhan. And uh, what the WHO report added an extra level was those early cases that they had sequences for. Okay. So um, everybody's heard about the, the, the B lineages, the variants of concern, you know, the B117, et cetera. Uh, you know, that B stands for lineage B. And there's also an A lineage. And so the A to B lineage split happened very early uh, in the city of Wuhan. And the WHO report is, is very granular, very clear about this. Most of the cases at the Hanan market were, oh, well, all the cases at the Hanan market were B lineage. There are other cases that are A lineage that are linked to other markets, okay? So what that means is, is that any theory of the origin of SARS-CoV-2 has to account for, you know, not just the linkage to the market, but the linkage to different lineages of the virus at different markets. Now, uh, the wildlife trade, I mean, if, if the virus has emerged through the wildlife trade, that's, that's pretty easy to imagine, right? There was an animal or a group of animals, you know, maybe one animal passed it to another. The difference between A and B at that time is only two or three SNPs, two or three nucleotide changes. And so that could have easily occurred on the jump from one species of animal to another. But then all you have to imagine is that there's a group of animals coming from those farms in the south of China to the central city of Wuhan, which is a distribution hub for a lot of different types of commerce, including the wildlife trade. And they had an animal or two that was infected with lineage A. They went to some of these other markets. You had another animal infected with lineage B that went to the non-market. That explains it pretty easily. So presumably, these two lineages have a common ancestor. Yeah. Um, can we put a timestamp on that? Uh, we pretty pretty much can with the um, with the uh, time most common rec recent ancestor study. That most recent ancestor was a lineage A virus. It differs from some of the bat coronaviruses by you know two nucleotides. Uh, it turns out that the the virus that came over here to early on in our uh, part of the pandemic, the the WA1 strain from Washington is actually a lineage A virus that is. Yeah, probably as ancestral as any of the ones that were detected uh, early on in, in Wuhan. So, um, yeah, it happened early, happened, you know, right after the jump. <laughs> so uh, when? Well, yeah, middle of November, early November. Okay. Uh, you know, earliest probably October. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you saw, uh, Robert, there's a new paper out um, where they used a different, it's in molecular biology and evolution, they used um a different kind of analysis, not making a phylogenetic tree because, yeah, you know, the, analysis. Yeah, a, a timed analysis, and they can go mid October, early November. They think uh, would be the earliest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Robert, you you recently published on virological.org uh, another manuscript: early appearance of two distinct genomic lineages of SARS-CoV-2 in different Wuhan wildlife markets suggests SARS-CoV-2 has a natural origin. It's from May seventeenth. Yes. So this is what we're talking about now, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, to explain again why having two lineages is is compatible with a, or more likely to show a natural origin. So, I mean, it's it's perfectly compatible. It's a you know you can have a very simplistic e explanation how those two lineages got into different markets. I mean, all it takes is you know a few animals on a different truck. The supply mm. chain goes from one market to the next. But if we're talking about a lab leak, okay. Uh, the virus would have to come out of a vial in the lab into a cell culture, infect a worker. Then that worker would have to, you know, go out into the community and I guess make a beeline to 
one of the markets and then maybe that wasn't enough. They went to the other market and somehow during that period of time, the, the virus, you know, acquired these extra mutations, just the right ones mm. to, you know, send off this other lineage. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a, too many coincidences to, to actually be compatible with a lab leak theory. Now, there is another there is another um, what I consider fairly unlikely hypothesis that's been put forward by the Chinese government um, to kind of counter this lab leak hypothesis, I think, is the political intent. Um, and uh, it's the notion that somehow SARS-CoV-2 actually arose somewhere in some other country and was imported into China on frozen food. Um, and when I when I first heard this, I, th I thought it sounded totally preposterous. But then looking at the WHO investigation, because that was one of the things they wanted to go down every avenue, uh, they looked into it. And it's, it's not totally unsupportable. I mean, there's not really any evidence that that happened, kind of like there's not really any evidence the lab leak happened. It may even be slightly more likely, I guess, with these two lineages, yeah. right? Yeah, Alan, I totally agree with you. I mean, <laughs> if I had to say lab leak and, you know, frozen food, I would I would put them into the same bucket of extremely <laughs> unlikely. Uh, Bob, you seem to, uh, in this conversation, seem to favor the idea of um, an intermediate host, an animal, as opposed to direct spillover into humans. Could you comment on that? Uh, you know, I mean, if I've given that impression, I, I don't have strong feelings about it, really. Um, I mean, I, I think that it's entirely possible that there's a bat virus out there that is, you know, 99.9% .9 similar to, to um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, I mean, it could also have easily passed into some animal. You know, of course, you know, the whole secret of biology, at least animal biology, is, is that you know, the animals have to breed with each other, right? So they form little colonies out in nature. And some of those are in places where humans, you know, haven't, haven't, go, don't go or, you know, haven't gone. So they pass the, their viruses back and forth between each other. Uh, and, you know, only if humans has, happen to intrude on their, you know, their space would we possibly be, uh, you know, susceptible to getting that. Now, one of the things that we've learned, I think, which is very important about SARS-CoV-2, is this, this is a pantropic virus. It's a generalist virus. It can infect a lot of different species very easily. It has no trouble, you know, jumping from a human to a dog to a cat to a tiger to a gorilla uh, to a mink to a ferret. I mean, you can, you, the numbers of species can go on and on. And, you know, this is a, a characteristic of naturally emerging viruses that they, you know, they often don't have huge species barriers. I mean, I'm thinking about a virus like rabies, you know, which is sort of the, you know, the ultimate, you know, zono zonotic infection, right? Uh, I think this group will know, but there may be some of your people in the audience don't know. There are about 60,000 deaths each year from rabies, you know, coming from, uh, you know, either, you know, the, either dogs that, you know, in other countries like Africa and Asia, where we don't have the big vaccine uh, programs, uh, but, you know, other animal species too, including directly from bats, which were probably the, the ultimate reservoir for, for rabies. So, you know, these zoonotic infections occur all the time. <laughs> Robert, um, taking a, a few lines from this two lineage paper, you, you make the comment that certain animals may have been removed from the market, from the Huanan market after, you know, the first cases. And, and Peter Daszak mentioned that that's what you would do. You would clean up, right, to stop an outbreak. And then you say, it should be noted that environmental samples that did test positive were associated with a portion of the market where wildlife or wildlife products were sold. Could you explain that to us? Sure. So I, I think a lot has been made. And er, early on in the, in the outbreak back, you know, in even, you know, February or so when the Chinese government was talking about it and after, right after they closed down, closed down the Anon market, they were basically saying, you know, we closed it down because we think it's linked to the wildlife mm -hmm. uh, that was sold in the market. And, and so I, I, you know, some of the wildlife that's, that's in these markets is, you know, perfectly legal. It comes from farms. The Chinese government encourages it. Some of the other wildlife that's there is, is sort of, you know, quasi-legal. It, it, there's a, a trade in it that, that doesn't always follow all the guidelines and things. Um, so I think it's not 
too much of a stretch of imagination to think that in the couple of weeks when you know people were starting to point to the, the Hanan market as a potential you know focal point for the for the outbreak that you know some of the traders there got those animals out of the market and um you know, I think that some of the lab league proponents will point to some of the things in the WHO report where, you know, some of the carcasses that were left over, some of the few, you know, ones that were frozen, whatever, mm. tested negative. Uh, they'll point to the fact that, you know, there have been reports that, well, we didn't have those animals there in the market uh, in that virological post, if anybody wants to look at it. Um, you know, I, there are a couple different references. Uh, there's a reference to a paper by Eddie Holmes and Cell, where he went to the market in 2014. The Chinese officials that he was traveling with actually brought them, brought him to that market as a potential point where, you know, viruses could spill over. Uh, Eddie tells the story of a raccoon dog that he watched being taken out of a cage and basically, you know killed and, and converted into food, you know, right before his eyes there. Um, there uh, was a CNN report uh, back early in February, I believe, or, or March of uh, some internet footage that had been, or uh, footage that had been taken at the market, clearly showing animals like raccoon dogs and, and other animals that are susceptible to, you know, these Sarbico viruses. And then on the internet, if you believe things that are on the internet, uh, circulated before the, uh, you know, before the, um, the pandemic started, it's actually a menu of animals that you could buy uh, at the Hanan market that, you know, are clearly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, animals like civets and raccoon dogs and rabbits and other things that, that we know are, are susceptible to this virus. So I think it's a pretty good bet that there were viruses there in the market. Mm. Yeah, I think as you point out also in this piece that that's where we should be looking. That's the high frequency likelihood rather than a virology lab spillover, right? Yeah, that, and much, much more likely. I mean, there are many more contacts that uh, people having uh, with bats. I mean, bats are used for food. I mean, some of these animals are large, the size of a chicken, basically. Uh, and they're used for meat and they're used for traditional dishes, uh, you know, for ceremonial dishes in China and traditional medicines. They're used all around the world uh, for food. They're, they're one of the most abundant mammals on the planet. So it would be surprising mm -hmm. almost that an animal of that size wouldn't be trapped in use for food. Well, uh, and we, we probably ought to mention just for, for listeners who didn't follow it necessarily at the time that in terms of focusing on the market and, you know, the, the wet market and this and that, th this is of course a movie we've seen before. This is the SARS story. And so I, I know for me, at least in late 2019, early 2020, when we were hearing about this novel coronavirus coming out in Wuhan and, and the first mention of the one on wet market, it was like, of course, this again. You know, where else would it be? <laughs> Almost. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, as Peter Daszak said, the thing to do is to tra trace back the wildlife and into the suppliers and see if you can find anything. If there's yeah. something there, it might be, you know, it's, it's a ticking time bomb, right? You have to do it before they go away. Yeah. Well, my friend Eddie Holmes uh, has said often, follow the animals. And that's where we're going to find the origin of SARS CoV 2. Right. But um, it's worth noting. Um, I mean that we won't necessarily get there, yeah. at, at least not in a timely manner. And I and I would just point out if you study the supply chains for an American grocery market, and one of my picks a few weeks ago was mm -hmm. actually a book about exactly this. It is astonishing how convoluted and difficult to trace mm -hmm. our food is. You know, we we have these flashy supermarkets, and we think, oh well, we're above these wet market things. No, we're not. Our food is just as primitive, it's just in prettier packages, um, but it's just as infectious uh, potentially. And, um, yeah. you know, the, the notion that we'll, we'll trace back the supply chains from the Huanan market, yeah, we should certainly be working on that. But I, I don't have tremendous faith that that'll necessarily get us to the definitive answer in a short period of time. And, and Alan, speaking of picks, I'll, I'll give you mine, <laughs> even though I'm not allowed to, but I'll do it anyway. I, <laughs> no, you're allowed. Sure. Okay, I'm allowed. So it's an article by Amy Amy Maxman. It came out in Nature. I think it's yeah. also in Scientific American. <laughs> uh, Amy is, it's Dr. Maxman, actually. And she's um, written a, a, a very insightful article about, 
you know, the lab leak hypothesis and, and how it's taking the oxygen basically out of what's really needed to be done, which is, uh, first of all, cooperating with, with China. We need their help. That's where the interesting bets are. You know, we've already seen two, you know, pandemic virus, coronaviruses emerge from there. It would be a real mistake not to enlist the, you know, really excellent virologists and other people there that are, you know, going to help us maybe stop the SARS-3 or the SARS-4 or whatever yeah. ever down the line. Uh, but Amy does a really excellent job of just putting this all into a sort of context, what we really should be focusing on. I think you, you pointed that out. And, right. and um, Robert, you you just stole Vincent's pick, so that's absolutely oh, gosh, perfect. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's no, that's okay. beautiful. That's <laughs> we can do a double pick because it's a great yes. article, and this it's, is it's why an this is why you know the science letter from the scientist Tony Fauci and other scientists suddenly saying, "Yeah, this is possible. We should look into it." it makes it's just crazy because there's no evidence as you have said there's no evidence for a lab leak there's plenty of plenty of evidence for a natural origin i just yeah, don't there's think. real data there's real epidemiology there's there's real precedent for it yeah uh, for the lab leak not so much <laughs> well, I, I would like to just jump in and defend tony a little bit here um and maybe maybe smear my own professional a little bit uh he tends to be very selectively quoted and I, he he even complained about this when he came on the show. Um, so, you know, this, yeah, he did say we should investigate this, but I don't think that's inconsistent with anything that he's said before. He has he has still maintained, even just this past week, that this is this is highly unlikely. Yeah. But he admit he he will agree. Yeah, it's of course it's something we should investigate. If if we find any evidence of that, we should follow it. We should look for evidence of that. Of course. Well, as no, the, as but, Peter Daszak said, hey, if anybody has evidence about the institute, let us know because yeah, we didn't yeah. we didn't yeah. find any, right? Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. Let's let's put it to rest, really. 90 days from now, maybe we'll get an intelligence report. And you know, I hope they do follow the science and look at, you know, what all the evidence is. And, uh, you know, then maybe we can put it behind us. I That's have the only justification I can see for uh, for doing this is to try and put it to rest, though. I at least it'll be something that people can point to. I don't I doubt it's going to put it to rest <laughs> completely, but at least we can say uh, we did it. And and uh, here was uh, the result. But my concern is that uh, what's really necessary to move forward with this is cooperation. Uh, between yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, among governments, and in particular between the Chinese uh, and the U.S. government, which we had. Okay, I mean that's where a, a lot of the best data comes from is from these cooperative efforts, and that's being threatened with all of this. And well, that's did, too bad. Didn't after our TWIV on Tuesday, China say we're not doing phase two of the WHO yeah. thingy? Yep. And I'm sure it's partly in response to all this nonsense. Sure, being I'm sure it's entirely in response to all this yeah. nonsense. So why don't we think about what we're doing, folks? That's what the Amy article in Nature is all about. You know, come on, we should think about this and uh, we need to cooperate and we're not going to do that if if we bandy these around. And as a Anlin said earlier, I have no confidence that a 90-day intelligence report is going to provide any science that we don't already know. In fact, no science because they don't know science over there. <laughs> And, uh, well, let's let them look at the flu that Alan mentioned that was surging there in, yeah. in November. Yeah. Let them look at the fact that, well, if you had three cases, you know, there were probably 100 cases. Let them look at the serology. You know, I mean, there's nothing to it. And, <laughs> and what makes things worse, Bob, is that now Facebook says, OK, we can have posts saying this virus came from a lab. They had banned it for a long time, which was great. And now they've caved because all these Wall Street Journal, et cetera, are suddenly publishing garbage. And it's all, and you know, we're trying to fight back, but we're a small voice here. Yeah, we're a minority. You're right. We're, we're the, you know, we're the, um, the, the people that are, you know, we're that one man in the 12 angry men. We're the <laughs> ones that are, uh, true. That That's are true. Just, you know, I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, we're the minority of people that, that think it is not a lab like. <laughs> well, and it's, I, one thing I try to point out whenever this comes up is the people who are, who are arguing, oh, it could have come from the lab. This could have, um, you know, when you say stuff like that, you, you're making, it, you're lodging charges against identifiable people, 
You know, this is not a trivial matter. This is something where there there are individuals that the lab has a director who's responsible for it. And you're saying they they screwed up and they're covering up. I mean, that's the charge that's being lodged when you make this argument. I'm not saying we shouldn't that, that we should say that we can say that it's impossible. But just we need to approach this with skepticism and we need to insist on actual evidence and not just speculate. Well, it, it's not impossible, but there's zero evidence, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I mean, let me point to the serological data, too, because it shows that n nobody in, in Dr. Xi's group seroconverted. Right. So if, if you believe it was even just an accident, that they somehow or other had SARS-CoV-2 and didn't know about it, <laughs> then you have to also be saying, well, she's not telling you the truth about the serology. So, I mean, all, all the various levels of the lab leak, and, and I agree with you, I don't think it's, that's really a lab leak. That's it's just some variant of, you know, the virus emerged from nature. It just happened to be a scientist. I mean, it could have been a botanist. It could have been a, you know, a paleontologist, somebody out in nature looking at animals. You know, it didn't necessarily have to be a virologist, right? But, you know, it, we, we catch all the heat, uh, you know, for, for going out into nature, I guess. But, you know, you have to believe that serology is just made up or... You know, covered up too somehow. Um, Robert, can we talk about the furin site? Because in fact, I think this has fueled a lot of the recent discussion. A very prominent virologist said the furin site is a smoking gun for a lab origin of SARS-CoV-2. So let's debunk that, please. <laughs> Okay, well, I know the virologist you're talking about, and he's a brilliant guy, but un unfortunately, I, I don't think that, that he looked at it very closely, or else he wouldn't have, have come out with, with that statement. And, and hopefully, maybe he'll set the record straight at some point in the future when he, when he does, you know, maybe he's incentivized now to go take a look at some of the actual data. So the fear and cleavage site, uh, for those of you that aren't, haven't been doing this for every day for the past, you know, 16, 17 months now, I mean, it's a 12, it, it's a 12 nucleotide insertion, basically, if you compare it to the you know, viruses like RATG13. And it, it encodes for a uh, PRRA, sequence of so the 12 nucleotides, you know, four amino acids. And that creates in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, a furin cleavage site. Now, why do I think that that's not a, you know, an engineered insertion? It could easily, you know, when you first look at it, when, when somebody like David Baltimore looks at it and says, oh, it's not there in the other Sarbico viruses or the closely related ones, uh, that's unusual. I mean, you know, yeah, frankly, when I saw it, I lost a little sleep over that too. And, and so, um, but when you delve down into it, when you actually look at what those 12 nucleotides are and the sequence, you'd realize that, that no experienced virologist would have inserted that sequence in that way, or even have known how to do that. Okay. So first of all, the proline that's in front of the, uh, the fear and cleavage site. You know, that proline actually makes some sense when you have SARS-CoV-2 to, to guide you because there are other coronaviruses that, that have prolines in that, you know, similar location. But until you saw SARS-CoV-2, didn't know that that might be something that you might want to put in there. So I don't think there was any virologist on the planet that said, okay, maybe let's put a proline somewhere <laughs> like close, you know? The, the other thing um, is, is that the RRAR, the furin cleavage site, is a minimal furin cleavage site, okay? The actual sequence should be RXAR, okay? So some other amino acid, not the arginine there. So that's a minimal furin cleavage site. If you were a you know a virologist studying this, you would have probably put in you know R R A R or some other you know or maybe even better than that R R A R R you know something to make it into a you know a, a more efficient furin cleavage site. Um, so the other thing is is that you know there are a lot of these furin cleavage sites in beta coronaviruses, and I think that one article by uh, Nicholas Wade basically said it's not in any other beta coronaviruses. Now he corrected that when he put in his, you know, quote from from Dr. Baltimore. But um, there are, in fact, a lot 
a lot of other beta coronaviruses that have here in cleavage sites. I mean, the big example is, is MERS, but there are also human coronaviruses, OC43, uh, Hong Kong University One. Th these are, are beta coronaviruses that have here in cleavage sites. So it's not so unusual. In fact, there are five subgenuses of beta coronaviruses. We know that four out of the five, you know, including now the Sarbico viruses, have viruses with furin cleavage sites. So it would almost be unusual if, you know, you didn't eventually find a, you know, Sarbico virus that had, had one of these things. So the other thing, uh, I can I can go on. Mm -hmm. uh, Please. You know, the, yeah, and we mentioned this early on in the Proximal Origins paper. Um, that proline and, and some of the surrounding sequences, some of the serines there and threonines actually make the uh, site um, predict that you will have O-link glycans put on there. Okay, now, you know, there's a little bit mixed, you know, in the literature. If you look, sometimes you find them, sometimes you don't. But if you actually know what you're doing, looking for the O-link glycans, you can find that those sites are actually used and in, in, in some of them are used in SARS-CoV-2. And, you know, it, it we speculated in the paper that, you know, okay, maybe it's somehow or other protecting the site from the immune system. It looks like now it's probably more likely that it's doing something with regulating the cleavage because there are examples from that in other other systems that we didn't didn't know about that have been pointed out to us. And so the, the point I'm going to make is, is that, you know, those O-link glycans are also present in other bar, other S1, S2 junction sites in coronaviruses that, either have the furin site or they don't have it, you know, a lot of coronaviruses put O-link glycans right in that one particular location near the S1, S2 junction. So, you know, going back to our hypothetical virologist, the, the one that, you know, is, is better than anybody else I know and probably anybody else that you know uh, that has had the insight to design this, this furin cleavage site, they would have had to know first, let's put a pure uh, a proline there, let's design it so that we have, you know, O-link glycan so it gets regulated the, in the most optimal way when it gets into an animal. And I, I just don't think anybody has that inside. So the other uh, comment that's made about the furin cleavage site, if I understand it correctly, is that the uh, uh, actual codon usage in the site is somehow suspicious. Can you comment on that? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll make two comments about that. The other thing that an experienced virologist would, would not do is probably put that insertion out of frame, okay? <laughs> so it's it's not, you know, you'd put 12 nucleotides in perhaps, maybe, uh, but you wouldn't put them out of frame. So it's actually out of frame. And, and Bill Gallagher, one of my longtime colleagues, pointed that out to me at first. It's it's out of frame. So why would you do that into the lab? I mean, that, you know, the, you're, the worst, worst postdoc you ever had would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the other thing is about the codon usage. Now, uh, some people have pointed that out. Uh, there's some papers there that says the CGG, CGG is unusual. I mean, it's unusual, I guess, if you're a bat, because that codon doesn't get used very often in bats. But it's actually one of the more common codons in, in humans and, and other, other species. So nothing unusual about CGG, CGG. It's just... Uh, I think just a, a gish gallop of, you know, a, a bad information that's been thrown out there. There's nothing unusual about having two CGG codons after each other. So, so it actually takes a lot of work to see that. I mean, when, when you look at the sequence and you see this, this thing that stands out, obviously the human eye is drawn to that and you say, oh, that's an insertion. Um, but then when you look at it at the, in the broader landscape of coronaviruses, including coronaviruses that are known to infect humans, um, you see, and, and knowing that coronaviruses recombine like crazy as we do, this actually is pretty easy to perceive happening through the natural route. I mean, absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and in fact, um, um, what, what did you just say, Alan, again, remind me, you were talking about the, uh, Insertion. Recombination and and insertion and how the inser how the insertion jumps out at you initially when you look at uh, it. Yes. So when you first, in fact, your friend uh, Bill Gallagher wrote about this a year ago on uh, Virological. He said, you know, if you look at the protein sequence, it looks like it's stuck in. But if you look at the RNA of RATG and SARS-CoV-2, it's not just stuck in. It's completely consistent, right? And he said, RNA don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Indeed, he did. It was really good. I, I've also enjoyed reading his words about this as well. Um, Bill has a way with words, but he's he's a he's a Cajun too. So, <laughs> ah, very good. Um, 
so uh, what is there anything else we could mention that would you know clarify things because as i think you alan just pointed out you know you have to dig deep to counter these things that nicholas wade says it's a rare coat on it's this and that the normal person on the street is not going to dig that deep is there anything else we can no i think that's very insightful i mean it, it it's easy to think, oh, it came from the lab, and there's the lab there, right? Yeah. And, and so, I mean, that that selling that point is is pretty easy. It's a it's a quince. They they say, oh, how could that possibly be? That's just not can't be a coincidence. Well, I, I would answer that by saying it's it isn't a coincidence. That lab was built there because of <laughs> SARS one, <laughs> and, and you know it was put in central China because you know that's a beautiful city. People want to live there. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, we shouldn't have these labs, uh, biosafety level three, four labs in, in big cities. We should put them out, you know, in the countryside somewhere, you know. I mean, how many, how many academics, how many, you know, really good virologists would you want that you would want to live, you know, 100 miles away from, from civilization? I, or in I, Hamilton, Montana. <laughs> <laughs> well, Montana's a beautiful place. Let's, let's, let's give them that. But, <laughs> that's, there's, there's some reasons why you might want to, might, might want to live up there. But, but, you know, I mean, I, there's a reason why we have BSL, uh, you know, labs in places like Boston and, and other places like that. So. Well, Robert, there are some people who argue that we shouldn't even be studying these SARS like coronaviruses from bats in the lab, which to me is preposterous, right? I mean, ignorance is hardly ever the best choice that you want to make <laughs> here. I, th I think it's actually a, quite a dangerous choice. And that's one of the problems with the, you know, all this emphasis now on, on lab leaks and, you know, that, that kind of thing. It takes away energy from what we actually need to be doing, which is cooperating with China and other countries to, you know, to learn what the diversity of, of Sarbico viruses and, and other, you know, potential pathogens are. Yeah. If we just shut that down, if we say virologists are too dangerous to be, you know, allowed to do their work, then we're going to put ourselves in a much less, you know, a much per, more precarious position next time one of these things do, do, does emerge. Um, one thing I forgot to bring up, uh, Robert, there's another paper on virological uh, from February uh, with the same team. Uh, Spike protein sequences of Cambodian, Thai, and Japanese bat sarbico viruses provide insights into the natural evolution of the uh, RBD in the S1-S2 cleavage site. What, what's that about? Okay, so, I mean, some of the lab leak proponents have also been pointing to the fact that, well, RATG13 and um, some of the other closely related viruses um, are, are maybe made up. <laughs> they may be, have contri been contrived um, by people like uh, Dr. Shi at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, put into the, you know, put into the international database of, uh, of viral sequences to obscure the fact that somehow or other they had SARS-CoV-2. And I mean, this is actually, yeah, I mean, people actually say that. Some of the people that have signed those letters that that have, you know, put us in the position where we're at now, the, the so-called Paris group and others have, have, have claimed. And I think you've heard about Dr. Yan, the uh, Steve Bannon's protege, mm -hmm. you know, claims that these are, are made up viruses and, and, and they won't you know, they pretend that there's you know, something unusual about them. They, they maybe were just typed into the computer somehow. So that, that, that's, that's what this paper is actually about, because there have been viruses that have been isolated and sequenced since the pandemic started. Cambodian virus from, from bats there, a uh, Thai virus, a Japanese virus. And what the purpose of that virological post was to show is that they have what we'll call motifs things that are, you know, short sequences of amino acids. There's one sequence, QT, uh, QTN, uh, that is um, right before the furin cleavage site, okay? And, and that motif is actually found in some of these other viruses, like the, well, it's in the pangolin uh, guangdong uh, coronavirus, it's in the Cambodian bat coronavirus. It's a sequence that we didn't know about before SARS-CoV-2, but here it is in a virus isolated and sequenced after the pandemic started. So how could a virologist know to actually put that exact sequence into SARS-CoV-2? It had never been described before. So any notion that RATG13 uh, or RMY, 
NO2, uh, another virus that has an insert at the furin cleavage site is falsified, made up fake, some problem with it, um, you know, is thrown out the window when you look at these sequences that came from nature after the, after the pandemic started. And some of these have a few basic amino acids there, right? It's not a, it's not quite a furin site, but it seems to be getting there, right? It's it's getting it's getting there close. It's definitely yeah. you know some sequences like NSAR things like that that are that you know just a few nucleotide changes and yeah. another insert small insert you'd have a furin cleavage site. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what does that tell us about the extent of sampling that has gone on in nature and what kind of sampling we need to do? <laughs> <laughs> it's very minimal at this point in time. There's a lot of every one of these new viruses that you know Vince was kind enough to point out in this post, you know, that have been isolated recently, has given us another little inkling, another insight into you know the exact diversity uh, the diversity of these coronaviruses in nature. It's extreme. I mean, these viruses are uh, interacting, they're going from bat species to bat species. Uh, you know, very similar virus in three different bat species, for example, uh, what was just described by Eddie Holmes and his group. And so, um, you know, they recombine with each other. They can exchange bits and pieces of information, some of them, you know, that are very similar to SARS-CoV-2. So it's just a question of finding, you know, which recombinant is out there in nature and in which animal, and then we'll have our progenitor to SARS-CoV-2. Do you think we'll have that at some point, Robert? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm optimistic. I mean, I'm not 100% certain, you know. I mean, it's, it's a tough thing. I mean, I think that, um, you know, was... Uh, some reporter asked me about this recently. I, I am optimistic that we'll keep looking. Mm -hmm. We have to be incentivized to look. If we make the pro political climate so toxic that we can't do international exchange and work yeah. with scientists yeah. from other countries, then that'll be a whole lot more difficult and we, we probably will never find it. But, um, you know, if we are allowed, if, you know, and if, you know, people in China and other places that have, you know, these related bat species keep looking, I think they'll find it. I mean, we certainly in other countries, you know, Cambodia, Thailand, et cetera, the one could sample. But do you have any sense for whether at the moment China is interested in, in doing this sampling? Is it going forward? Do you know? I mean, they, I, I mean, and there are people that are still in contact with their colleagues in China that I'm in contact with. And they say, yeah, they're doing it. They're okay. intensely looking for, uh, you know, for the for viruses and animals and, and other things like that. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think they'll find it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I would just point out, uh, I think in SARS, um, it was something, it took something like 14 years mm -hmm. before we finally got to the bat. Right. Um, I mean, we had the early understanding that this had come through the civets in the marketplace, but where did it come before that? And to get to the actual progenitor virus took all of that time and work that was incidentally done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, so, yeah. so, so it, it can be done, but I, I, yeah. I'm, well, I'm not sure other, how long this the, is going to take. Seasonal coronaviruses, we know those came from animals, yeah. Yeah. but we don't know precisely which animal. I mean, HIV, yeah, there's a chimp virus that's very close, but, you know, is there something else out there that's even closer? It's only, you know, 98, 99% similar, right? Hepatitis C, where did that come from? You know, I mean, Ebola. You just, go, yeah. Ebola, you just keep going down the list. I mean, it's, it's kind of unusual, actually, to have figured it out. I mean, we know with Lassa virus, it's mastomies, but we're also discovering new reservoir hosts for Lassa virus, too. It, it's in a lot more animals than we thought originally. So, yeah. Well, last night on PBS, they uh, had a little vignette after they discussed all of this, of course, in, in excruciating detail, which led to no conclusions whatsoever, that it said in the in 1918, we still don't know where that flu came from. <laughs> yeah. well, so that's a long time ago. It's hard to know. Exactly. But, but Robert, for SARS-1, don't we know that there's a cave where there, are, among all the bats, all the bits that gave rise to SARS-CoV-1 is, but we don't have one virus that's the clear ancestor, right? That, that's that's true. That is okay. true. It's it's still it's still questionable. Okay. Well, it's not Man, easy. I'm ready. I'm ready to put on my wellies and go out there. Yeah. And right. sample yeah. Bats, <laughs> Let's <you know>. go. <laughs> I'm ready to go to Malaysia. Maybe uh, Kuala Lumpur. Maybe that's that sounds like a good place. There are bats there. You know, because there's an answer out there. This is yeah. uh, this is a, an, a really interesting sure. and important problem. Yeah. It's where we need to put our energy and our international relations and politics and everything. This is what we absolutely need to do. We need to know yep. the diversity so that we can be prepared, 
you know, have a vaccine ready, you know, or at least, you know, an idea of what would work well uh, for a vaccine. Uh, and it's not just coronaviruses. There are a lot of other things out there, too. If we, if we shut down the work of virologists in the field, we're going to be in deep trouble. Well, and it's not just in um, places that are that are far from where we're currently located. Um, I mean, we talked a few years ago on TWIV about uh, heart lung virus. Yep. Right. You know, that's <laughs> that's yep. a fairly short flight. Yep. Um, yep. So th this stuff can happen anywhere and we really ought to be sampling everywhere. Absolutely. I think Absolutely. it's a good way to end this conversation. We should be cooperating, not fighting. Right. 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 I disagree. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. Okay. I vetoed that remark. <laughs> Robert Gary, Tulane University. Thanks so much for joining us today. Pleasure. My pleasure. Great Thank having you. you. Thanks. Thanks. This is great. And, yeah, I'll come uh, back. Yeah, when, when it's sorted out or close to, we'll have you back. We'll talk about it again, okay? Okay. Thank you, Vince. Take care. Bye bye. Another good one. That was great. Really good. I, I'm very I'm very frustrated with this situation. It was a great follow up for yesterday's uh, TWIV also. By the way. Yeah, well, these two in one week, I think, will provide they some, great. you know, information for people that uh, don't have it otherwise. Absolutely. But, mm -hmm. um, and in fact, we have a few emails here that reflect that. Um, let me take this first one from Joshua. Dear Vincent and the Twivets. Twivets. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Twivets 760. I could not be more appreciative of all you do and the work you do. It's been a hard week for science. It's been very disheartening to see not only the mass media, but also public voices like Fauci fan the flames of conspiracy and bigotry. As we've seen in Atlanta and indeed all over the U.S., these words are not harmless speculation. They are used to stoke anti-Asian hatred with violently real consequences for people shown by a shocking increase in hate crimes during the pandemic. Additionally, as we saw in 2003 with the invasion of Afghanistan, such evidence-free conspiracies leveled against entire countries or governments can lead to conflagrations that immiserate millions in the fires of war over a whole generation. I hope those voices spreading such contagious idiocy are shamed into human decency, but I'm not holding my breath. It is, however, no small consolation to hear you all multiple times a week, continuing to stick to the facts and continuing to propagate a bit of humanity. Panhandles and all, this world would be a darker place without Twiv right now, so thank you. <laughs> all the best, Josh. Amir, eco-hydrology technician in southwestern Georgia. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Rich, can you take like the next two? Sure. Sean writes, uh, why the lab leak theory is unlikely and gives a link to a uh, an audio article from Politico. Um, and and the, I forget, I listened to it. And I forget the uh, person who's the principal in the uh, interview. It's 13 minutes long. It's quite good. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, there was, uh, um, you know, a minor misstep at some point. I forget quite what it was, but generally uh, it was quite good. So that's worth a listen. Uh, Henry writes, dear Twiv, unfortunately, China is not cooperating. I would be curious to hear your comments this week. I do not see how Twiv and Peter Daszak can completely dismiss the possibility of a uh, lab leak, albeit still the least likely scenario. The hopes for finding the origins of SARS-CoV-2 has just gone up in smoke. From NBC, similar reporting on uh, New York Times, WAPO, ABC, that effort was underway when China announced Tuesday that it wouldn't participate in phase two of the WHO's investigations into the origins of uh, COVID-19. Um, I, I don't know quite how to respond to this. This seems to go on both sides of things. Uh, I think that uh, we've, we've kind of done this already in this episode, but, um, you know, a responsible scientist will say no. And Peter even said this on the uh, podcast that no, we cannot dismiss it entirely. Okay. But there is no evidence to support it. 
Yeah. And as I've said before, the only way it's supportable, and we, uh, others here have said it before, the notion based on the information that we have now, the notion that there was a lab leak is predicated on the assumption that several people are lying. Okay. And personally, uh, I see no evidence for that. And I choose not to go there. Okay. Now, maybe I'm naive, but I think it's going to turn out that that's not the case, that these are responsible scientists doing their job uh, and that the truth is being told uh, and that the conspiracies are inaccurate. No, we can't rule it out at this point, and you're not going to be able to until we actually find the origin. Uh, but it is, I believe, given that it's the least likely thing, a serious distraction. And it's also muddying the political waters, which you point out in your letter, is unfor and we've already talked about, is unfortunate. This is a mess, okay? Uh, and I hope it blows over soon. The only possible upside to this uh, 90 days, let's uh, get this done with, is that maybe we can get it done with. It will never, the conspiracy theorists, theor uh, theorists will never go away. That's fine. Right. But at least um, uh, we can perhaps get back on track and that can be, you know, sort of dumped in the QAnon dustbin uh, and, uh, and move on with the real science. I suspect anybody else, that anybody uh, else want to rant? I suspect that <laughs> I suspect that with time, China will come around and participate. Yeah, because we kind of know. Yeah, I, they understand. And, you that. know, yes, they do. They too. understand they that. Well. You know, this is what get this is what gets me. Uh, the vast, vast majority of people involved in all of this, the people walking around the markets, the people working in the laboratories, are just people. Okay who yep. are just yep. trying to get through their day and do the right thing. And that goes for the mass of the people in the U.S., the mass of the people in China, right. and elsewhere. And if the politicians would just get out of the way, <laughs> uh, we could get on with it. And it will happen. It will happen. I, I would just like to jump in here on the notion that China is not cooperating, which is how Henry leads off his letter. And, and okay, look... If a bunch of foreigners showed up at your place of work <laughs> with no legal authority whatsoever and said, we think you might have done something wrong. Show us all of your paperwork. <laughs> How do you think that would be received? Because I, I think in most workplaces, I mean, if you did that, if you walked into Vincent's lab and did that, I'm just guessing here. But you'd hear a phrase that would end with something like, and the horse you came in on, right? <laughs> I mean, you're, least, you're not just going to be That's shown minimal. the door. You're going to be thrown through the door. That is minimal. So uh, the previous episode covered this very well, where you were talking to people who actually went there and dealt with this situation. And, and they were appropriately respectful because they were guests in another country yep. and you can't just go in demanding stuff you you gotta respect yeah. everybody's trying to do the right thing for the most part and take that as your baseline assumption um and as rich has pointed out you know for for the lab leak hypothesis to be true You've got to invoke already, just with what we know, you've got to invoke a whole bunch of people lying and telling not just little lies, but really big whoppers and maintaining them and maintaining consistency in that story. And if you listen to, to TWIV 760, um, you know, you'll hear about how these questions were asked repeatedly and there was consistency in the story being told. That's just, it's not credible that this is that this is an active conspiracy I, I i do not dismiss possibilities okay everything is possible all the time we live in in a universe of probabilities uh, it is highly highly unlikely and you know this this all this discussion about how china needs to do this china needs to do that just knock it off that's not how you approach these discussions Right, exactly. That, that's my feeling as well. You know, I think that Rich points out that we can never say definitively 
that no, this didn't happen. We, we cannot uh, completely discount the possibility. But if I look at the two options of lab leak or natural origin, I see lab leak involving um, making a lot of assumptions that are hard to make. They're, they had a virus they didn't tell anybody about and they got sick with, they hid the serology and they, you know, there, there's a lot of assumptions there. Or if I look at the natural origin side, I can say, oh, it's a pattern just like the same pattern that we've seen with other um, infectious diseases, um, mm -hmm. particularly with SARS-1, but with many others. Yeah. And so yeah. you're, I'm basically making a choice of, do I want to believe a, you know, an idea that makes requires me to make a whole lot of assumptions that I don't have any evidence for? Or are you asking me to um, so go with something that looks like a pattern I've seen many times before? Um, and to me, it's, you know, one of those seems more likely than the other, though you can't ever say something is 100% impossible. It's interesting, actually, when you look at the, uh, uh, those natural surveys that have been done, it seems to me like all the pieces are out there. And the mechanism is well characterized. There have been spillovers all sure, the time. There's sure. dozens mm -hmm. of these characterized. Okay, what's, what we're missing so far is enough sampling to find somewhere where all those pieces are in the same place. You we know, have right? plenty of examples of spillo zoonotic spillovers. There's no example of a brand new virus coming out of a lab, which is not to say it can't happen, but I go with the probabilities. In exactly. <laughs> right. Me too. So I, I just want to say something here because there's a <laughs> parallel fallacy that we are still living with that it's not going to go away just because we say it isn't so. And that is that the last election was rigged. There are people out there that are still looking for votes that were cast illegally or that were hidden or that machines were broken and they're not finding anything. And they're doing it three and four and five and six times. Now, how much evidence do you need? I mean, if we had that much evidence in science, 15 people would get the Nobel Prize for every great idea because everybody comes up with the idea about, about the same time. This this requires evidence. That that's there's no evidence, and that's still a conspiracy. So people are willing to buy into conspiracies if it fits their political view, and this fits into the same way. I'm afraid to tell you this, but this at the say at the highest level, it fits into we have to outcompete China. So yes. China must be guilty of lots of things, and this is just one of many. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, we're going to find evidence for it because we're going to – well, you can't make it up. Well, you could do that, but that would be wrong. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, I, I, Brianne, I totally 100% side with you and everybody else on this panel. It says, show me the data. And I'll, I'll start to look at it, and then I'll tell you whether I think it's plausible or not. But when you start making it up, that, that bothers me a lot. And eventually those people are caught and they're found out and they end up with broken lives because everybody says, oh, of course I knew they were like that. They lied to their sister when they were 12 years old. You know, they find evidence for, for now disengaging and, and moving to the other side. Once this animal is found, and let's hope it's soon, that's going to put everything to rest until the next conspiracy emerges. I, I don't think it will put it entirely to rest, but it'll at least take it out of the front pages. We will have data. We yes. will have data and we'll say, look, you don't Here's believe this data. Yeah. You want to see it again? You want to see it again? You want to see it again? I can show you to it as many times as you'd like. Dixon, and um, uh, sorry. Peter Daszak on the last two have said, if you mix politics with science, you, you get, get politics. politics. That's right. That's yes, right. That's, that's right. Great, oh, no, great I, I know Peter very well, and, and Peter, <laughs> he has a good, uh, dry, and wry sense of humor. Indeed. He was, yeah, he's a, he's a good man. He's a very good man. Uh, Alan, would you take the next two? Sure. Uh, Thomas writes, thank you in all caps with multiple exclamation marks. Uh, I had hoped so much that you would wade into this murky pool eventually anyway, and that you would dedicate an entire episode to the topic and bring along the three of the principles was more than I dared to hope for. This was a true public service. You should be proud of yourselves. Many thanks to you and your guests. Best regards. And this is obviously in reference to TWIV 760. So thank you very much, Thomas. Much appreciated. I was not on that episode, but I, I made a point of catching up on it before this week's episode because I knew that this was going to be an important one to listen to. And it is, it is a great episode. The guests were outstanding. And we're all proud of ourselves. You should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, then Mike 
Right. So you mentioned in the most recent podcast that there are over 700 episodes in the archives, some of which are excellent. I have no doubt that is the case, as I always enjoy watching the light bulb go on in the co-hosts' minds when a revelatory idea or surprising information is being discussed. I was hoping you would like to give a list of your suggestions of the best episodes to listen to. For those of us that discovered you during COVID, it would be good to go back and pick up some of the highlights from all the years before COVID. Um, Mike, and it uh, looks like... I guess Vincent inserted a number of these and um, uh, the people, have been annot- people have been annotating. People have been annotating. Well. I got a few okay. of these in here. Uh, yeah, it looks like the group has coalesced on a lot of the ones I, I would have pointed out as well. So there's Twiv 200, Threading the Needle, 68, Ode to a Plaque. That that one is a ton of fun. Um, and then three, 346, A Double Helical Career, Joan Stites. That, that's great. Really, really good. Uh, 500 keep up keep virology weird that was a that was a blast uh 691 sci art with laura splan okay good choice that was great yeah that was great i love that 682 of course uh kate rubens from the international space station though, though i will say that um before that happened before that episode i would have made sure that kate rubens other episode was on yes. this list yes um, so both of kate rubens episodes i think uh merit Search okay. Kate Rubens on the TWIV site. Yeah, and, yeah. And, by the way, I have found that if you just do a Google search for TWIV and whatever topic or person that you're interested in, you can usually find it despite <laughs> yes. the yeah. goofy titles. Yep. Yes. Um, TWIV 400, this I always point people to, to, to as one of our all-time best Um and more credit to our guests than to us, I think. Uh, Harold 400 Varmus, a scientist for all seasons. He was amazing. Uh, Twiv 219. He no, oh, he's, <laughs> it was amazing on the show, is what I was saying. He remains an amazing person. Um, 219, Fauci Pharmacy, another excellent, excellent uh, interview show. Uh, 161, Concerto in B, very good choice. That was another Another fun one. And of course, Twiv One, <laughs> West Nile virus, where it all began. Could not pick number one. <laughs> yes, you, you got to. And um, I guess it was Kathy who pointed out it, uh, any yeah. of the year end summaries give you about 10 favorites for each of each year of the show. So there's your starting I w- list. I want to make, uh, hmm. uh, and by the way, uh, you can find, uh, if you haven't, uh, well, you can backtrack and get out your pencil and paper, but uh, all the letters, the Twiv letters, are archived so yes. that you can find this list. And I want to make one more comment. And that is that most of these are, in a relative sense, uh, pretty light. Uh, but two of them, Ode to a Plaque and Concerto in B, are hardcore science. Yes. Okay. But perfectly understandable. Okay. So uh, I think some of the people who've um, uh, uh, joined on recently have not heard some of the uh, uh, hardest core science and uh, those two are good samples of that. Yes. All right, Dixon, can you take the next one? Yes, I can. Emily writes, I am or was a faithful listener to TWIV since pre-COVID times. Lately, I haven't been able to keep up with every episode, so I apologize (laughs) if this has already been noted. There are less than 100 pages left in Walter Isaacson's new book, The Codebreaker, Jennifer Dudner, Gene Editing, and the Future of the Human Race. And would you look at that? There's (laughs) a mention of TWIV. Congrats and keep up the good work. I think it's Doudna, right? Doubt him. Doubt Okay. Doubt him. Fine. Wow. I didn't know that I, this I, was a thing. I, Isaac, Walter Isaacson. Wow. Yeah. I, I sit corrected. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. There's a yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. She's good stuff. So there's a picture of the um, page and yes. um, the, the passages about. One of the two scientific field marshals was Jennifer Hamilton, the Doudna protege, who a year earlier had spent the day teaching me to edit a human gene using CRISPR. She grew up in Seattle, studied biochemistry and genetics at the University of Washington, and then worked as a lab technician while listening to the podcast This Week in Virology. And of course, Jennifer wow. <laughs> used to do our timestamps. Wow. What's a timestamp, so- you say? <laughs> What's a timestamp? How much does a timestamp cost? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I once had the privilege of uh, having dinner 
with uh, Walter Isaacson and his daughter and several other people at a, um, um, a World Science Festival in New York City. And I remember sitting next to his daughter and she looked at me and she said, say something nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I, I couldn't think of anything. You know, I would just say, um, I should have quoted something from virology. I, I, I didn't do it, but it, uh, yeah, she was a hoot and so was he. And by the way, this is the, the this week in New Orleans because uh, Walter Isaacson is from New Orleans, huh. by the way. So this is very nice that Isaacson mentioned this week in virology because, for example, you know, there was a article this week in the Wall Street Journal, which start, which catalyzed a lot of this garbage we've talked about. Um, and um, they cite the, the interview I did with Peter Daszak in 2019. And they say on a podcast in 2019, Daszak said this. It's like, really, you couldn't say. You couldn't this, name the podcast. <laughs> it's not like we make money off this or anything. The podcast that shall not be named. <laughs> I um I I mentioned that to a, a publicist and he said that was really nasty. So thank you, Wall Street Journal. That was that was uh, it, probably because referencing a podcast that consistently contradicts the narrative the reporter was telling in that story. Maybe, right. yeah. That's Maybe. In, that, in that case, I'm proud of it. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. right. That's right. Well, as soon as I saw this letter, I immediately uh, sent a message to my friend who has been reading this book uh, and why cool. he didn't tell me this first. <laughs> yeah, right, right. All right, one more, Brienne. Sure. John writes, Dear Vincent and colleagues, thank you for highlighting our work on the novel OPV candidate vaccines on TWIV 756. It has been an honor for me and for PATH, shameless plug, check us out at path.org, <laughs> to participate in this project, which has been a remarkable international collaboration built on a foundation of great research. I note that the phase two studies in adults, children, and infants are complete and the primary research results are published in two articles at the first link below. Several other publications are in various stages of development and peer review, so keep an eye out. Additionally, you might be interested to know that the, the novel OPV2 vaccine, Candidate 1, was listed for emergency use by the WHO at the end of 2020, the first vaccine ever to receive such a listing by the WHO, although COVID vaccines were not far behind. <laughs> and the vaccine is manufactured by Biopharma in Indonesia, the world's leading supplier of OPV. Thanks for all the great work you're all doing. Um, and John gives two links, uh, one to a Lancet article, um, as well as one to news about the novel uh, OPV2. Cool. Nice that... Nice that someone in a vaccine organization is listening, right? Yeah. yeah. I like that. Very good. And and John is global head of polio at PATH's Center yeah, for Vaccine cool. Innovation Access. Wow. Um, so I did not know that a company in Indonesia makes most of the world's OPV. Of, yeah. Did you know that, Alan? Mm. I did not. Yeah, I, very I, good. The, the supply chain continues to amaze me. <laughs> yeah, you bet. All right. Time to do some picks. Dixon, yep. what do you have this week? Well, I have a mind-blowing uh, <laughs> website that uh, just has an almost infinite number of optical illusions, although the, the guy who established the website, Michael Bach, doesn't call them that. Uh, they're, they're sort of like a, a movable eye candy. And one of them is a, is a spiral, or I'm sorry, it's a... Uh, black and white disc that's slightly offset from the white from the black and it keeps spiral yep. it turns and you're supposed to look at it three times and then look at the buddha figure and if you do tell me what you see <laughs> yeah the buddha's coming at me buddha's yes! coming at you yes exactly the other spirals are going in yep. and the buddha is coming out and now. by the way you can get this effect um, I, I experienced this once on a, <laughs> flying? on a train ride. No, it was on a train ride okay. where I was sitting in the, in the back, backward facing seat on a oh, commuter right. style train right. and riding along. And, and I, you know, instead of reading or looking at my phone or whatever, I was just right. kind of staring idly out the window. And after a little while, the train came to a stop. It wasn't my stop. So I was sitting there and the clouds were coming to get moving. me. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. That's Certainly right. just getting bigger. Is this yes, kind yes. of uh, Doppler effect for visuals? Something a like bit, that. A little bit. So I spend a lot of my time, or used to, on the river fishing. And trout fishing is a, 
an unusual sport in many ways, but the, 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 the spot that I want to talk about is just when you're casting your fly and you're looking at your fly, the fly moves at the same speed as the current. And so you're constantly following the current. You're constantly following. The moment you finish fishing that particular place and you step out of the river, the trees in front of you start to move. <laughs> <laughs> or you get on a boat that you're out fishing in and it's rocking back and forth. Right. And the next day you're still rocking back yes. and forth. <laughs> like a terrible sway. When so I, we, have yeah. memory, we have memories of things that we embed into our psyche yeah, that yeah, then sure. come back out. And that's what this is all about. I just love very that cool. side. That's very love cool. Very cool. Yeah. I didn't know like this. It. Lovely. Thank you, Dixon. That's Glad awesome. Like like Brian, what do you have for us? Um, I have an article that I thought uh, people would enjoy called The Arcane Research That Prepared Us for COVID-19. Um, and it actually talks about uh, the history of studying mouse hepatitis virus um, and the background of mouse hepatitis virus and kind of what that taught us about coronaviruses um, and sort of this, this basic background. Um, and I think this is a great... Uh, description of the importance of sort of basic science research and how it can have really important and interesting implications. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're looking for a, a short digestible piece about why this basic research on viruses that you don't necessarily imagine having any importance or important, this is why. Yeah, it's, uh, this is great. it's featuring uh, Susan Weiss, who told a lot it of is. this story on TWIV, right? Yes. yes. That's very good. Yes. And I, I'm liking this this whole site, COVID19prequels.com. Yeah, the whole site which, is that's really That's the theme of the whole thing is is the prequels. Yep. Yeah. And and they're all very well written. There are, you know, if you look at cool. this, there are uh, you know, quotes from Lin Fa Wong and you know, a lot of the the people who you should be talking to to explain this whole process yes. and how we know about all of this. So are you saying that in virology everything is important? I, I am actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and but I'm also saying That's what that, I thought. <laughs> but I'm also saying that we can't necessarily predict what we are going to learn uh, in different basic science of course experiments. Not, of, course yeah. not, of course not. And, and I think a number of uh, former TWIV guests are, are coming up in these articles. Yes. You have to be yeah. prepared to be surprised. Yeah. Great. Cool. Rich, what do you have for us? So this may be obvious to many people, but maybe not. Uh, my favorite podcast is the uh, Hidden Brain podcast by uh, Shankar... Um, um, uh, uh, Vedantam. Make sure I got his name right. Shankar Vedantam. This started out, this is basically uh, an interview based podcast with one guest a week that's been going on for 10 years. That's about psychology and it's about what goes on in your unconscious and how it influences uh, your biases and your perspective uh, and et cetera. Uh, and it's very well done. Uh, he was with, uh, he started in about 2010 doing this, uh, you know, building on some, uh, a book that he'd written and some other stuff. And uh, he uh, did it with uh, NPR, it was sponsored by NPR for about 10 years and it has become popular enough, like we're talking Vincent, 2 million downloads a week. Uh, so that, uh, he's now taken off, uh, on his own and it's, uh, all just as good and it's a real easy listen. You know, I can listen to it while I'm gardening. It's one of the few things I can multitask to. Uh, and I just, <laughs> I just really, uh, enjoy the in insights. I just listened to one recently about humor. Okay. Yeah. And about the role that humor plays in, in, in our lives and where it comes from, et cetera. It's all very good. Yeah, these are topics that people uh, identify with, right? Yeah. Because it's about them, Absolutely. whereas viruses, sure. it's harder because <laughs> it's not always about exactly. them. It's mean, against them, not by them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in this past year it has been, but Sorry. most of the time uh, people don't. Uh, so yeah, that's why when we you listen, Yeah, when you listen to these, you identify yeah, with that's the right. topics because right. you, can, you can feel it. Yeah, that's the key. You have to get people Rich, would in. you like to modify your statement, though, and say it's your second most favorite podcast? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> I thought that... It's I your favorite podcast that, that you're not on. <laughs> right. Thought, yeah. Sorry. sorry. Favorite just, podcast that I'm not on. That's a good way to good. put it. That's yes. good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Alan, what do you have for us? I have a paper, um, but don't worry. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not... 
Well, actually, it is it is is a fairly chunky read. Um, so this is uh, by Valerie Reyna, who's at Cornell, uh, scientific theory of gist communication and misinformation resistance with implications for health, education and policy. All right. So gist mm. is I mean, it's the gist of things. Mm. Right. And you're going to pick up this paper and you're going to look through the abstract and you're going to start reading the paper and trying to get, oh, okay, what's the central message here? What is she getting at? That's exactly her point. <laughs> right. So that's how we understand the world. She got you. We, we construct things in, we want to get the gist of it. And the importance of this <coughs> And, and based on, I think, some from, from her research and from other research in, in neuroscience, um, there's, there's this idea that the gist is not just the facts, okay? Mm. The gist is a whole construct from our complex, tribal ape, emotion-driven brain that we put together. And part of getting that is we want to get to it quickly, because it's not the same as a heuristic. A heuristic is a shortcut, a mental shortcut that you use. Oh, I've seen something like this. It must be like that. That's a heuristic. Uh, the gist is not a shortcut. As she says, it's the destination. It's what you're trying to get to. And the importance of this for science communication is that a message with an easy to grasp gist is the kind of thing that goes viral. And that sticks in people's minds, especially if the gist of it is something that that fits well with their values, because that's okay. also part of this construct. And so you've got something like the lab leak theory, right? The gist of it is real easy to get. And it fits very well with a lot of people's values and preconceptions. And so it snaps right into place and it's very, very hard to dislodge. And facts alone will not dislodge it because there's more to it than facts. And so read this paper, it's open access, is I found it really enlightening and insightful and um, very, I think very useful. The bad news is that there isn't a quick, simple answer. I can't give you the gist of how to how to address this problem in science communication when a bad idea latches on because it has an attractive gist. So, Alan, don't you think, though, that there have been lab leaks in the past with viruses and sure. other organisms? So there's a reality there that people oh, no, no, are right. So part of filed it, it away. I mean, yeah, people and people, it fits into that. And then why not this? It too? fits that and it fits the notion sure. that sure. Uh, there's somebody to blame. Blame. It places the blame on a villain that's popular for a, no a large demographic it. of that's Americans right. these days. Um, it and not just China, but scientists. Yeah, it's right? Sacco so, and Vincetti. It's Sacco you know, it hits, it, it hits a lot of notes that that people like. Um, and it also, as I've commented about conspiracy theories before, conspiracy theories are in some ways a lot more attractive than a reality in which nature is trying to kill us all the time. Right. So yeah, would you yeah. would you rather live in a comforting reality where where things are happening because people cause them? Or would you rather live in a reality where there's there are random events in an uncaring universe that can just, you know, delete us in a in an accidental swipe? Um, so, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to sink your teeth into in this just concept. It's, it's and, telling us why dictators can take control of an entire country. Sure. Because some of what they're saying Attractive is true. Attractive ideas, right. Some of what they're saying is true. Not much, but some of it. Right. And as a result, the rest is all believable. It's a seductive gist. There you go. <laughs> cool. That's very neat. All right. My pick you've heard already from Robert. It's the Nature yes. article by Amy Maxman. Uh, we got the gist. We got the gist. Fit. We got we the, the gist, gist of it. <laughs> Divisive COVID lab leak debate prompts dire warnings from researchers. So- I like it because, the, you know, the people who have started this really are not thinking of the bigger picture. Well, first of all, right. they're not looking at the data, as we've already said many times today. Exactly, but they're exactly. look, not looking at the bigger picture. We have to cooperate with China and not alienate them. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here about what people said and didn't say. But uh, the 
the main thing I want to point out here, first of all, Kristen, Christian Anderson, who was mentioned today, maintains that no strong evidence supports a lab leak and worries that hostile demands for an investigation into the Wuhan Institute of Virology will backfire because they often sound like allegations. And that's really yep. good. And then at the end, a um, person, Fiddler, and I'm not sure who he is, but he says, uh, Fiddler thinks the U.S. should focus on fostering pandemic diplomacy through meetings between U.S. and Chinese ambassadors. Don't we actually have some things we need to do to get ready for the next pandemic, given the <laughs> debacle of this one? <laughs> debacle. So I, I thought it was good. There's also a, a similar article in The Atlantic, which is good. Maybe I'll pick next week. But uh, yeah, I think the, the dialogue doesn't get helped because the Wall Street Journal wants to get views, page views, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. And we By have the way, you can find Fiddler on the roof if you're looking for him. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go there, but I... <laughs> <laughs> it's a low-hanging fruit, Alan. I yeah. took it. <laughs> um, so we have a nice listener pick from John who says here, uh, Moderna has had their Science Day webcast May 27th, which is yesterday, but there's a link to it. And they do this every year. It's wonderful. Typical for corporate webcasts aimed at investors and email addresses required to register, um, but they don't verify the email. I assume that company lawyers require collecting email addresses just in case the company ever wanted to c- correct the mistake from the webcast. Ha, maybe I doubt it. But you can listen to it. Um, yeah, you got to register. Put your name, but make up something if you don't want to give it. And then there's a PDF for the supporting materials, which yes. I have used in the past, um, full of stuff, all kinds of graphics that you might want to use, um, you know, about the virus and about the vaccine and so forth. It's just chock full of graphics, and there's no problem if you want to use it as long as you don't make money off it. Because I use it all the time in my talks. I used them last year. So really good. Thank you, John. And I didn't realize they did it every year. It's like Science Day webcast. It's great, isn't it? That these great Science Day webcast. Yes. Love it. All right. Twiv 762. The show notes are at microbe.tv slash twiv. Your questions and comments go to twiv at microbe.tv. If you enjoy what we do, and even if you sometimes disagree with what we say, if you generally enjoy it, Please consider supporting us. I understand it will give you a good feeling to do that. Microbe.tv slash contribute Dixon de Pommiers at triconella.org, the living river.com. Thank you, Dixon. Oh, you're welcome, Vincent. This was a expansive, fun time for me today. Expansive. I had a great time. I'm good. sorry, I was a little bit late. Sorry, I was a little bit late. How's the uh, internet? They, Is it uh, all fixed? They gave us a new modem and they gave us a new serve, uh, whatever they call those things. And we've got, yeah, it works. Sure it does. Let me see if your video is a little better here. I'm going to, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah, the same old face. Well, the, the video is the same as it was before, but uh, that's fine. Thank you, Dixon. Welcome. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He is currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Fair enough. Always a good time. And once again, a privilege to be here. We have Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I really enjoyed uh, everything I learned today from Robert. Did you like the 762? That was a good one. I did. That was also fin- there, those, fantastic. Those three were awesome. Uh, I really, I don't know how you couldn't feel better after listening, but I'll tell you, we got some emails who disagree and you're not going to ever hear them. <laughs> Yeah, I made the mistake of reading some of the comments to the uh, video. A lot of them are very good, but some of them... People are negative. Uh, um, You know, you're welcome to your view, but can you be nicer about it, folks? (laughs) Oh, well, I guess not. Alan Dove's at alandove.com, Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I guess they don't get the gist of it, right, Alan? No, they don't get that. Well, the problem is <laughs> they have they have an established story in their heads. They have the gist of something exactly. else. Too. Right. Exactly. People, people will then say, oh, I'm just trying to get the facts. No, you're trying to get uh, the any facts that will support the story you've already yes. built in your head that you don't want dislodged and you want to discount any, any yeah. facts. No, that, I, I totally agree. Yeah. If they don't get sure. their narrative supportive, they don't like what you're doing. Yeah. And this is, a, this is a small number of people, but they're there. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're, but they're the ones who are going to comment. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>